we're going to dive into what constitutes a digital computer and uh, we'll give a little definition. If we're talking about a modern computing device, something that's a general purpose computer, computer, smartphones, um, tablets, things that uh, can do a variety of tasks that are not designed to only accomplish one specific thing. Uh, that would be like a microcontroller that's controlling, say, a um, uh, exit gate at a um, at a parking garage or something like that. Those might be task specific um, computing devices. But in in the case of a modern general purpose computer like your smartphone, uh, I'd like to define them as the intersection between uh, a set of hardware, a set of general purpose hardware, and a wide variety of software. Uh, you can't do anything on a computer if it doesn't have software running nowadays, and you can't do you can't run software without uh, equivalent hardware to run it on. So this intersection between software and hardware is what I'm going to define as a computer, and I'm going to be talking about microprocessor-based computing, which is primarily what occurs um, uh, nowadays. Software, on the software side, we really have a layered type approach. Um, the uh, layers consist of the application, the operating system, the drivers, the BIOS, and what I'll call microcode here. Um, it's a top-down system from complexity to simplicity, uh, from uh, wide availability to uh, fairly uh, very small amount of interaction. You, the user, uh, almost always interact with what would be considered the application layer of software. Uh, that even includes when you're doing things in what you believe to be your operating system. So for example, if you're using Windows or Mac OS and you are moving files around in quote, the operating system, you're actually using an application that's running on top of your uh, operating system. That windowing uh, file system application, it just comes bundled with the actual operating system. Uh, the rest of this, the operating system, the drivers, the BIOS, the microcode are really all parts of making your computer operate and making it easier for application developers to communicate with your computer. So the application layer is designed to solve a problem. I mean, it's, it's going to do something for you. So, for example, it's a word processor. It's a calculator. It's a uh, file management system. It's a compression uh, program like zip files, et cetera. It actually does something for you. Uh, they're widely varied. Uh, they're loadable on demand, so you can load a application into your computer and have it run, and then you can take it out and run a different one. Uh, the general purpose computing aspect um, is very evident in applications. Uh, and they're typically written in what are called high-level computing languages. Uh, these are things like languages like C Sharp or Java or uh, JavaScript or whatever that um, are multi-purpose, general purpose programming languages uh, that are fairly easy to write software in. That's generally what is used to write application software. The next layer down is the operating system layer. And operating systems are created in order to provide sort of a common interface to all the applications. So when I write application software, uh, I want to be able to create windows and um, talk to hard drives and things like that. And to, to make that simple, the operating system exposes a common set of functionality to the application developers. And then the operating system then has to talk to the layers below it uh, to provide functionality on the specific piece of equipment that you're running. Uh, this kind of provides a buffer between application developers and the low level hardware uh, of the machine itself. There's generally a limited number of choices for operating systems. I mean, we're all familiar with some of the big names like iOS, OS X, uh, Windows, things like that, uh, Linux. But uh, there's a, many more uh, esoteric operating systems. <coughs> there are many more esoteric operating systems available as well. Uh, but the number of operating systems are significantly less than the number of applications that are out there. Uh, the next layer down are the drivers. Drivers are uh, high-speed uh, pieces of code that expose um, common behaviors for the operating system. So the operating system wants to talk to a printer. It wants to do it in a single manner. Uh, even though there are thousands of different brands of printers out there, 
you don't want the operating system to have to understand how to talk to every single one. So you create another layer in between where the driver manufacturer or the printer manufacturer might create a driver that talks properly to the hardware that it has and talks properly to the operating system on its side. Again, another buffering type system. These are generally optimized to run very uh, quickly and, uh, and they are hardware specific. Um, and usually they're written in what we call low level computer languages. These are ones that are uh, a little bit closer to hardware, uh, things like C or uh, sometimes even assembly language. Um, the next layer down is the, the BIOS. This is the small amount of software that loads when a computer uh, first boots up, takes care of getting the computer up and running, and it also provides a basic interface between the operating system and the computer. So things like uh, accessing the hard drive initially um, and uh, controlling how this, the information moves around inside of the computer, uh, how the computer wakes up and goes to sleep. These are all things that can be part of the BIOS. Um, Generally, there's a few manufacturers of BIOSes, and then those are adapted specifically to the uh, hardware on which it's running. And then at the lowest level in this hierarchy is microcode. This is code that runs directly on a CPU. Uh, it, 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 is, it can be used to customize CPUs um, so that the chip designers don't have to redesign the electronics inside the chip uh, to make modifications. Uh, but you can also think of it as the code that actually runs in the chip. Um, and so these are very hardware specific. So the, the code that runs inside of a uh, Intel 8086 uh, family of processor is different than the code that runs in, say, a Motorola uh, chip. And um, so eventually, in order for anything to run on your computer, it has to be translated into this low-level CPU code. Um, and uh, it, and so when you say in a very high level language like print, uh, it eventually has to become a series of instructions that the uh, CPU can understand. So as a software developer, you, you may develop anywhere in this stack. Uh, most developers work in the application level, uh, a, a, a more limited number work on operating system level, uh, and a very, probably, I would guess, a very small number work directly in the BIOS and the microcode uh, level. Uh, most developers work up higher in this stack. So in the big picture, um, what's the number comparison between these things? And uh, there are millions of applications. If you just add up the number of apps, if you just add up the number of apps that are available on a, um, on the Apple and Android store, you get numbers in the millions. Uh, if you then include all of the custom applications and uh, things that are available for different operating systems, uh, you're gonna get, I would guess, in the tens or hundreds of millions of, of applications. Uh, drivers, I mean, you're gonna need a driver for almost every piece of hardware that you plug into a computer. And so there's that, you know, hundreds of thousands of different devices you can plug into your computer. So therefore there are probably hundreds of thousands of different drivers. Uh, once we get the operating systems, there's just a few that are commonly used. Uh, there exists probably hundreds of them currently in use. And in terms of BIOS and microcode, it's really hard to guess numbers because there could be thousands of variations of BIOSes if you count every model of uh, motherboard that goes into a computer has a slightly different variation of a BIOS, but it's really the same uh, base code that's shared among a wide variety of hardware. And the same thing goes from the microcode. Uh, you have the entire family of Intel processors, which shares a lot. But if you go into individual different models of processors, your count could go pretty high. Uh, but by, by far, the application level dominates this picture. Now, if we flip over and talk about the hardware side, uh, hardware we we'll oftentimes think of as this laptop that I'm looking at right here. Uh, it, desktops, smartphones, mainframe computers, supercomputers, these are all examples of hardware. Uh, but when we dig a little deeper, we begin to realize that these computers that we deal with 
have some common functionality in them. They have CPUs, they have memory, they have motherboards, uh, they have hard drives and network adapters, etc. Uh, lots of parts go into these. All of these parts are also known as hardware. These are physical devices that do some sort of computing. As we dig a little deeper, the motherboard really becomes sort of the heart uh, uh, or the, the body system of your computer. And it includes things like clocks, uh, address bus, memory bus, uh, memory caches, and uh, other things that help a CPU, which is sort of the brain of your computer, to talk to the different other pieces. So when the CPU needs to get something out of memory, it needs a method by which it can communicate with the memory chips that are on the motherboard, and it does that across the address bus and memory bus. And so there's a, a, a intricate dance of electronic signals that are maintained between the various aspects of a computer, and the motherboard is responsible for shifting all of this data around inside your computer. If we dig a little deeper, uh, the most significant piece of your computer is the CPU or the central processing unit, and it has uh, generally a section called the arithmetic logic unit, which does the math and comparisons for you. And it has control units and input and output methodology and things. Uh, so in most modern computers, everything has to pass through a CPU to be acted on. Uh, a lot of modern computers have more than one CPU running, like a graphics processing unit is a CPU dedicated specifically to managing the image that appears on your screen. If we dig deeper into that CPU, that CPU is made out of a series of what are known as logic gates. And logic gates can perform logical operations, and they can be combined together into form a wide variety of, uh, of, of logical tasks, like storing memory, in what's called a latch or, or flipping back and forth between two different values or pro providing functionality like ands and ors. Um, computer software or computer engineers are able to combine these uh, simple, very simple circuits together into really complicated uh, patterns of behavior. And if we go even farther into those logic gates, we find that they're made out of a variety of transistors. And if you uh, if you wonder how many transistors are inside your computer, the, the more current range of uh, CPUs made by Intel have somewhere on the order of 1.75 billion transistors uh, all working together to provide functionality and behaviors that are repeatable and uh, operate super quickly. So um, now that we've gotten down to the very, the very lowest level of these devices that we call computers, it's really just a combination of a lot of transistors. So what is a transistor? Well, a transistor is an electronic switch. It is able to be turned on or off. And uh, when current is flowing through the transistor, we consider that transistor to be on. And when current is not flowing through that transistor, we consider it to be off. And these transistors can be are, require a small piece of semiconductor. And the, the most typical semiconductor used is silicon. So then generally, you take a silicon wafer and you etch into it all these little transistors, 1.75 billion of them, onto a very small piece of silicon. And the combination of how those are wired together allows you to build logic gates. And uh, a very few number of transistors can be combined to form a logic gate. And then the, the amazing thing is, is that a very few number of logic gates can be combined to begin to create useful circuits like this one, which is a half adder. It'll take two bits of information and add it together. And then you can have full adders and you can have uh, circuits that compare things to each other. And you can have circuits that combine together to form memory. And so when we combine a bunch of these individual circuits together, we can build up from our transistors gates. And from gates, we can build up these complicated things like adders and latches and flip-flops. And from those, we can combine them together to create these arithmetic logic units and control units. This is what allows us to go find something from memory and pull it back into the, the arithmetic unit and add them together and store that result somewhere else. So the combination of those ALUs and, C, and CUs allows us to build what we would consider a CPU. And CPUs have gotten more and more complex over time. You take the original uh, Intel processor, microprocessor, it had probably 
I don't know, on the, I think it was on the order of 5,000 transistors in it. And now we're at 1.75 billion in an Intel CPU. So you can see that uh, humans have built on previous generations of knowledge to make these things more and more capable. So what does that mean? Um, modern devices like the CPUs you're used to all start out with a, a ridiculous number of transistors that have been wired together in ways that make predictable behavior. And that predictable behavior is, is controlled by a clock that, that makes the processor change state once every cycle. And your computer just does that over and over and over again so many times a second that it makes you be believe that it is doing lots of things at the same time. 